Thanks everybody for being here tonight. My name is Michelle Dezember and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at CAM. And when we were thinking about one of CAM's kind of signature programs, which is the Great Rivers Biennial and how we're celebrating the 10th edition this year, we had um, a conversation about how we could mark this uh, really important program for us. And we thought, let's celebrate, let's bring together some of the current and past winners, but let's also bring together some people in our community that help show how much of a group effort it is to support artists and how much um, really coming together um, to support artists is a core work, not only of the museum, but of our whole St. Louis community. So I wanna start by saying thank you to everybody for being here. Um, I'd like to also say thank you to the artists who are here. We have Sarah Paulson, Ivana Say, Juan William Chavez, and our executive director, Lisa Melandri, who will be having a conversation I'll introduce shortly. But of course, I also want to say thank you to all the great organizations that came and are here with very warm um, spokespeople. We have MAPS, we have Craft Alliance, Laumeyer, the Luminary, Kranzberg Arts Foundation, our friend Brandon from CAM is here, and then we also have RAC and volunteer lawyers and accountants for the arts. So let's start with a big warm welcome and applause for everybody for being here and showing their love for the artist community here. And um, I'll now segue to just giving, in case you happen to not be super familiar with what the Great Rivers Biennial is, um, the GRB was really launched in 2003 as a way to support artists in our community, and it's a collaborative program that's presented by CAM and the Gateway Foundation, who generously supports it, as well as tonight's event. Um, and the initiative recognizes talented, emerging, and mid-career artists who are working in the greater St. Louis area. Um, and each is awarded now with a $20,000 honorarium and an exhibition at CAM, which we have on view tonight, um, our current uh, iteration. And over the last 30 years, the initiative has awarded more than $600,000 to over 30 artists in the last 20 years. Um, the GRB artists are selected by a panel of external jurors, which makes our job at the museum just a little bit easier. <laughs> uh, they visit St. Louis and do studio visits with a shortlisted group of artists. There's, last year was a little over 100 that applied and 10 are shortlisted um, for studio visits. You see um, on the background there is a presentation that's been playing tonight and we'll come back on after the panel of an image from each of the winners over the last um, 30 years. And we have three up here that I'll introduce now. Are there anybody else in the room who has received the Great Rivers Biennial yes. Exhibition Award? Yes. If you are here, could you raise your hand? And actually stand up, because we'd like to recognize you Yay. too. Thank you, congratulations. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> we love embarrassing people. Okay. Um, but we'd also like to really uh, now turn over to recognize the artists that are here with us tonight. I'll start with Juan William Chavez, who was included in the 2008 edition. Juan is an artist and director of Northside Workshop. His studio practice focuses on sculpting space within urban ecosystems through partnerships and collaborations to address social and environmental issues. His work includes public sculptures, installations, drawings, curriculums, and unconventional forms of beekeeping and permaculture. Chavez has exhibited at Art Pace, Van Abba Museum, McCall Center for Art, and Tube Factory Art Space, and was recently included in El Museo's survey of contemporary Latinx art, Estamos Bien La Trienal 2020-21. His work has been supported by the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, Creative Capital, Joan Mitchell Foundation, Art Place America, and Art Matters Foundation. Uh, to the right is Ivana Say, who is included in our current 2022 edition. Um, Ivana is a German-born Ghanaian multidisciplinary artist, art educator, and arts advocate living and working in St. Louis. Ose was a 2016-17 Ramara Bearden graduate minority fellow at the St. Louis Art Museum and the 2017-20 curator in residence for the Millstone Gallery at the Center for Creative Arts. She's the recipient of the 2018 St. Louis Visionary Award for Emerging Artists, the 2018 Creative Stimulus Award by Critical Mass for the Visual Arts, the 2019 Futures Fund Grants by the Luminary, and the 2022 Stone and DeGuire Contemporary Art Award. She has attended residencies at the Cité Internationale des Arts in Paris, Fountainhead in Miami, and the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, among others. She received her MFA from Washington University in St. Louis, where she was a Chancellor's Graduate Fellow, uh, Mr. and Ms. Spencer T. Olin Fellow, and Danforth Scholar. 
She holds an MS in fashion design and business and currently serves as vice president of Surface Design Association, an international organization focused on textile and fiber arts. And <laughs> next to me is Sarah Paulson, who is a, a recipient in the 2018 edition of the Great Rivers Biennial. She is an artist, a filmmaker, and a community organizer with art projects ranging from experimental animations, social justice documentaries, and portrait paintings to parades and happenings. She has been inspired by the communities she has encountered. A Spanish speaker, her trips around the world to places like Spain, Mexico, and South America have informed her work with a love for storytelling, folk art, pageantry, and community ritual. Raised in Kirkwood, Missouri, Sarah Paulson's artwork have been exhibited widely in local and national exhibitions, and her prize-winning films have been featured in the St. Louis International Film Festival, the True False Film Festival, the Black Maria Film Festival, and the Motivate Film Festival, and Chicago International Children's Film Festival, among many others. A 2010 CAP Institute Fellow and 2015 Regional Arts Commission Artist Fellow, she has garnered numerous awards for her art and has completed several residency. And one thing I just want to highlight is that all three artists have also um, contributed to our education programs and have engaged with the community, so we're really grateful for the work they not only do to share their work with the public, but to also feedback to the community. That's just a personal note. Uh, so with that, I would love to hand it over to our esteemed executive director, Lisa Melandry, to get our conversation started. Thank you. I, I too want to start with a personal note, which is that I began my tenure at CAM in 2012. And that means that I have seen five great rivers biennials. And I think what is so extraordinary about that is that they have been so truly different one from another. Not just uh, the individual artist's work, what it is, and I think this is a perfect example, the panel of artists who make extraordinary work, all of it extraordinarily different one from another. So you really do understand kind of the range of creativity that is in this area. But I think one of the things that's a bit of the special sauce is of course the jurors. And because the jury is so different every two years, you really end up with kind of different sensibilities, different things that they are looking for. Um, and so that has really allowed us to see, again, the range of what we have in our own backyard. And we should feel so privileged to be in a city with this kind of, it's a sports analogy, deep bench of talent in the artistic realm. So uh, I just wanted to say that, that it's really kind of been my, my pleasure and my privilege to have seen so many iterations and now to get to the 10th edition. So we wanted to start actually speaking about GRB, and it's really interesting because, Yvonne, of course, your work is up now, so you're in the midst of this. But if you could all just kind of take us through a little bit about what GRB meant to you. And I mean that not just in terms of, you know, what was the show, how did you prepare for it, et cetera, but did it allow you to think differently about the work that you were doing? Did it kind of make you make work that might not have been signature for you? Um, and, and then in, in its after, and of course you, you haven't gotten to the after yet, you know, what was that like for you? And I'm going to just say, Sarah made um, infographics out of these questions, and so we're going to have these up in the background, which I think is wonderful for us to all kind of take a look at and think about as we're going through this. But I'm going to go right down the line. I'm going to start with you, Juan. Um, and again, like, w what was the experience of GRB? How has it lasted? What did it mean in the making? All righty. <clears throat> um, let's see. I'm going to try to break it down in a couple uh, parts here. I think the, f the number one, uh, uh, number one is that GRB was such a opportunity. It actually like inspired me to kind of move back to St. Louis. Uh, like it was uh, before like GRB, it was kind of almost challenging to see where someone in St. Louis could get their start. You know, there was there, there was some opportunity, but not uh, a grand scale as a museum and, and the money. Um, and then knowing that, okay, it's you know a challenge to get the GRB, but to know that uh, an outside panel of curators would be looking at submissions, 
I knew was also I important. So it was enough to take a risk to kind of move back to St. Louis. Um, and the second one is that it, it happens, you know, every, uh, uh, it happens, it happens, it constantly like happens. So if you don't get it, you can improve your game. You spend time in the space, you see other, you see how other GRVs are formatted. And it's something that you can kind of start honing your strategy, I guess. Uh, the community is intimate. So you can almost kind of see, like, who are the players, you know, what, what, what people might. And it's, I think it's doable to kind of strategize. So, um, and then the aftermath is, you know, I think it's something that I kind of learned is that when, when, you, get, when you get an opportunity like a museum show, uh, sometimes, you, you know, you, 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 you kind of take off like a rocket. But sometimes it's like a slow ripple. I'm kind of more of a slow ripple kind of person. So I didn't feel the effects, but I've, I felt it slowly kind of unfold. Uh, and it was the first museum that kind of trusted a chunk of money to me and, and validated what I did. And other institutions like seeing that. All right, it's good to be here. Um, I, I think for me, what it afforded me to do was to really embark on a travel, right? Initially, I had wanted the experience to be collaborative. Um, a lot of my, my practice is about collaborations with different communities. Um, but this time around, I went on that uh, personal journey of really discovering um, U.S. history for myself and going to specific areas, I believe it was over 15 locations in six different states. Um, the only way I could have uh, you know, afforded it was to get that support from a GRB. Um, what, what it meant, I, I think there is a level of a confidence booster that comes with understanding that three external jurors chose your, you, know, your, you to take up space. Um, at, at CAM, uh, but also the recognition uh, of CAM, and also working with, you know, Wasan and, and Misa and, and Jen, such you know incredible talent um, in the in the CAM team is something that you know you you cherish those moments really. Is it easy to go to the other slide, the next infographic? Sure. Can I just do it? Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, this, this was my representation of this question. Um, so for me, it was about like making this big dream happen. And I think, I think Matt Strauss was the one who advised us at one point, do what you would do in 10 years. So I think like I thought of it as like, I'm gonna collaborate with a bunch of people. I'm gonna be able to like pay them well, I'm going to have things built for this, I'm gonna give myself the time to make this project. And it definitely felt like the culmination of like several years of research. So it was like having then that time and space to kind of quickly respond to it. Um, certainly I loved having the conversations with the curators and the jurors and just having other people's like eyes on my work and then I think that there's like just the extra stuff from you, you get from it, like people writing about your work, the written material from Cam, the photographs, um, the, the ephemera that like I love to collect. And so all of that to me is like about also increasing this kind of exposure. So increasing the local audience, increasing the national audience, having community conversations, which is leading to other shows and artwork. I, I love what Juan said about the like slow ripple, because like, I had I got the GRB and then I had a baby, so it was like <laughs> slapped in the face in terms of like how my time went. And it, I mean, it was like one profound experience, then culminating to another profound experience. But like, I wasn't able to really like bounce quickly and use that the GRB I think as like a platform because I was so focused on baby. You know, if anybody else has children, you know that's what it's like. And um, so. I would say that it does still feel like a, a slow ripple for me. Um, but I mean, I think it, it just like, it grew my imagination, 
you know it grew my imagination in terms of like what could be done in the museum how I could have support to kind of create that that vision I think having the curator speaking with me and and talking with me about um, like where I was and then seeing things outside of me is always super helpful and so you know I think I left too thinking of like the network like even coming in here and like the, the handlers were my friends and the people installing were people I knew so it was like very much about I'm making this but it's really all these people helping me make it at the same time so it, like to add to that it felt important to me that I felt the responsibility of it so one thing I just wanted to mention before we go on to the other questions is also that we've thought a lot about, you know, this is an extraordinary opportunity, but it's three people, you know, every two years. And so we've also thought a lot about how can we expand what this is and how this process works. And you are not the beneficiary of this because we only had this bright idea later. But one of the things that we introduced was the idea of jurors actually picking 10 finalists and then coming to town and doing studio visits with 10 artists so that even if there are indeed three winners and there continue to be, at least there was a little bit more of a chance for a larger number of applicants to have the experience of these jurors in the studio, to be able to talk about their work, to be able to answer questions and also ask questions of the jurors about what they were doing. So I think that that, the relationship, the way that you are able, you know, you talk about it with regard to CAM staff, but certainly also the jurors, that becomes such a big part of this, is that conversation and that's what sort of allows, I think, um, just a, a little more broad touch from people out of town who are spending time with the artists in our community. So the next question is really specific and you sort of touched on it, Juan, about looking at, you know, you had applied and maybe you didn't get it and you're going to apply again. And Casey Zavalia, one of our um, uh, Great Rivers winners, said that she had applied I'm trying to remember what year she was in. I think she had applied si six times. Um, before she got it. I mean, and I think that that's really interesting, the idea that she was just gonna keep trying. And then there were a series of jurors who obviously were really moved by that work. And just for people in the audience who might be thinking about this or might have applied and not made it, you know, can you think back to your application process and talk a little bit about how you prepare for something like this? And um, I mean that in terms of even the really practical stuff about how you put that application together, and we are so lucky because we have here organizations who help specifically with those kinds of things, like MAPS. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, the process for GRB, but then also more widely in St. Louis. Like, how do you, how do you get your chops together to be able to, to, to apply for something like this? Uh, <clears throat> all right, I'll try to put this in categories. Um, well, I, once you, what, so every year I, I kind of look at the calendar and usually in the fall I, I kind of announce like it's art season and there's going to be a series of, of dates and deadlines. Uh, and then I, I refer to I go on the hunt. I, I look at who the drewers are, where they are, I look at all their shows, I, I read their writings, and I get kind of nerdy. And I just want to know what their voices are and what they've done. And intuition, I don't, I don't know if there's any rhyme or reason, but I base my submissions on, on that type of like research. Um, I feel like the more you do it, it's, it's like a, a muscle, uh, it becomes easier. Uh, and I always tell a lot of you know younger artists or students that once you write, like go ahead and apply to everything. It's 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 even if you don't get it, you've done something that you kind of don't realize that you've done, and, and that is that you've created uh, you've created your artist statement, you created a project summary, uh, and every time you do it, you get it tight to 
500 words, uh, 250 words, and you just constantly sculpt this uh, application, um, and then I kind of say I bait my hook and I cast it, and whenever it gets to the GRB or whatever, then I take that language and I run with it because it, it, it made it through, it's speaking, and so that's how, I mean, that's just my, uh, that's, just, that's how I prepare, that's how I evaluate uh, my strategies for applying to, to things. Did you know how to do that when you did GRB? I mean, was no, that the beginning? It was no, early. No, I mean, my first, I <laughs> laugh, <laughs> I laugh at the first uh, application uh, that I, I wrote. I think it was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm gonna drive around, I'm gonna think about, and the idea is gonna, and it was just like, <laughs> like a, like I was scatty or something. <laughs> so it was bad, it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really love the humor approach because art is subjective, right? You have to keep applying for, for things. Um, it's just, you know, what it is. There's just a lot of talented people in St. Louis. St. Louis is really choked with talent, um, and that's what you get when you're in a great city. Uh, I think for me, I started applying, I believe, back in 2018. My issue was not really with the proposal because I could get to the, you know, pass the proposal. I was shortlisted all three times that I applied. So it was really about now how do I get to um, have these three jurors understand my vision? Because, you know, as an artist, my practice kind of evolves with the spaces that I'm in. I don't have a definitive. Um, most of the time, it's, it kind of grows with the space. It's more site-specific or I'm responding to a particular location. So it's really hard for me to narrow it down and just give them a product, if you may. But I realized um, after the second time that I need to hone things in. And if I could create a model of the space, I should do that. Um, I remember exactly where I was. I was um, in, at Fountainhead in Miami. And I got the call uh, from uh, Wasan, I believe, and she's like, well, you've been shortlisted again, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, great, you know? And I, I remember sharing with one of my, my fellows at the um, residency that I have been shortlisted uh, three times with this thing. Like, I really need to get my acts together. And that night, we, he, he actually helped me build a model, uh, which I traveled to St. Louis with, and that's uh, kind of what I, Proposed to. So it really helps when you ha narrow it down, even if that's not how your practice is. You want to make sure that the three jurors have a, 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 a clear understanding of what you're doing and how you can transform the space and how viewers are going to respond to the work. Can I go back one slide now? Okay. That was my first one. Sorry. Okay. Um, I, I, I probably resonate kind of with what Juan was saying about like I'm always looking for like a seed of a project and I think when I'm coming up with an idea I'm like thinking of it as somebody something that can like shape shift and so um, even if I didn't get the Great Rivers the things I would be um, proposing I would be trying to propose at other places as well like I never see it as like this is my only chance and then I give up as an artist right like I'm like shaping something and so for me that shaping involves like getting outside editors like and multiple not leaving it till the last night so that I have people guiding me on the language you know all of us artists get super hard when we go and write things and it sounds like gobbledygook until you have like an outside reader that can kind of be like what are you trying to say like let's be direct you know and so um like with that have good images I am like not trying to reinvent the wheel in terms of myself. I'm not gonna be like, I'm Sarah Paulson, I'm gonna come in and do a, say, improv music performance. Like, that is not my skill set. Uh, I would have nothing to prove that with. <laughs> so I'm like looking for things where I have images, I have verbiage that like even ties into like the history. Maybe I'm expanding and I'm trying to do something new, but I'm not just trying to be like, this is, this is you know, an entirely new artist. Um, 
I ask myself if it's a project I truly want to make. That's from my experience doing other grant projects as well. And I have found moments where I like have written a grant, say with a community project, and there was an element I, I just realized when it came about, I didn't want to do it. And then later I was like, why did I write that into the proposal? Like, so like, I try to be really honest with myself about the thing I'm making and why I'm doing it. Um, I think of it as like sh the sharing the idea of something that I'm passionate about. So I, I feel a little cringy because I put up there, remove your sob story, but it's like, seriously, like we all suffer, right? Like I want to write in mind, like I work 40 hours a week and then I have, I'm caregiving 40 hours a week and then I'm trying to have studio in 20 hours. Like I want to write that stuff, but I take it out, right? Because that's like distracting from your like overall vision that you're trying to bring people in. Um, and with that, dropping the cliches, dropping the language that doesn't make sense. I show somebody that's not an artist because like an old friend that could be like, oh, this is BS. Or like, okay, yeah, I'm with you here. Like, this sounds like you. Um, and then, yeah, I try to like honor my attempts, right? They say like you get one out of every 10 things you propose to. I mean, I, like just hearing that they only had 100 people applying last, last time, I was like, oh my God, that's like one out of 10. That's some good odds. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I try to like, um, and I keep track of just my applying. So like my end thing is like, I tried 50 times this year. That's good. Okay, I got two things. Awesome. But like, I'm trying. So, so sometimes I just try to, to, to like th think about it more as like my efforts to put something out and to kind of build this vision and seed and not as much evaluating myself based on if I'm getting it or not. So I don't know if that's helpful, but. So now I want to turn away from Great Rivers in particular and talk a little bit more about the artistic community in St. Louis. And I'm curious from all of your perspectives, you know, how do you define that community? I, I think my perspective is that it is indeed, as I said at the beginning, and I've seen it through the lens of Great Rivers, a really, really rich environment where there are a lot of working artists who are here and contributing to the art world in many, many different ways. I do, and I can't remember what you said. You said there's, what you said, Yvonne, it's choked with talent. St. Louis is choked with talent, you know? Um, and so I wonder, what that artistic community means to each of you, how you define it, and you know, what, how do you engage with it? How are you a part of it? Because it's you know many many people, but it's also easy for communities, artistic communities, to be fractured, for it not to be easy to meet one another, etc. And I'm, it's a really big question, but I am really curious about all of your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's, it's, it's. <laughs> no, I, I, I really think that there's a lot of great people that are really dedicated to their practice. They're putting in the time, they're putting in the effort to make this a successful career. And we should not take that for granted, right? And uh, I think that when we do have the opportunity to honor and recognize artists, St. Louis artists, we totally should. Um, as far as uh, the art community here, I, I think it's, I find it to be intimate, but also really mighty, uh, because people tend to show up for one another. Uh, I think it's a testament that uh, even with um, John Young and Yoshi and Ko, that I have actually you know, been to their exhibitions. I, su I practically support them as they do support me. And the fact that we have that com camaraderie is, is testament, um, and and I, I think that um, people are accessible here. The art community is porous. If you do show up to Longmire Sculpture Park on their openings, or the Luminary, or you know Craft Alliance, um, people are going to start noticing you, you know. And so I, I always advise, um, you know people that move to St. Louis, uh, artists that move to St. Louis, that show up for every single opening, and you would truly be amazed how many friends you build up from that. And sincerely, not just showing up because y you want to be noticed, but sincerely pouring out your support for other artists is always the best way to go. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree with everything what you just said. I mean, St. Louis is, is kind of a, a nice place for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, there's, there's space that, I mean, you can actually uh, aff afford to live here and, and, and be creative. Uh, um, there is a institutional, like the institutions are phenomenal here. And then the artist run initiatives are energetic and, and also really, they got, they got chutzpah, they're, they're moving and shaking things as well. Uh, um, we're in the middle of the country, which, you know, a lot of stuff is happening, you know, and we're all making artwork uh, about it. And I think that's just a, an important, it's important work and it's being celebrated and highlighted. Um, and I, I agree with you, it's, it's kind of a, an intimate, you, when you go out, you can actually have access and, and talk and communicate with people. Um, there's a, a healthy kind of competition, uh, I would like to say, you know, it's not 100% like cutthroat or anything like that. And uh, healthy competition is, is really good motivation. You know, you kind of can literally, you know, you, you feed off other people's energy and, you know, what they're making in the studio wants, wants you to make in the studio. Uh, you know, if you go out and see shows, it makes you want to, like, uh, you know, be inspired to make work, too. So, um, and I would just say the last thing is that, you know, you, sometimes when you go to different places, there's a certain kind of, like, aesthetic. But I feel like the St. Louis aesthetic is so unique. It's, it's kind of all over the place. And so I don't feel like, I'm always surprised when I see other people's work because it's so different. Mm -hmm. And I really, that's what I really, really like about it. For sure. This, this question is really complicated for me because I'm looking around and I feel like I know so many people in the room from the arts community and uh, like what is even true for me to say in this moment? Um, uh, I mean, I feel like I stayed here because I kept having opportunities through the arts community. Um, I feel like if people see you trying, they will try to help you out. Um, I feel like I've been here long enough. There's probably some people I avoid. Oh, um, that's sad, right? Um, but that's real. And um, but then, like, there's just a way, like. We're all also kind of like lifting each other up a little bit. We know like what it is like to drink the water here and to like work here. And I think once you've been, some, you're somebody who's been like working here for a while, you know, you like want to go out and see what they're doing when you know that they've just been kind of in the same conditions with you. Like thinking of Chad, I'm thinking of Thomas. Casey Brandon. I'm just like looking around like, you know, so I mean, I think um, it's it's to me, it's like a amorphous thing. Like I felt a lot of love doing the People's Joy Parade and having all these different artists come out and be it in different moments and like not even on my ask, just on like their love, you know, for the neighborhood. And I've um, I think as like a new mom, it's been harder for me to like get out to everybody's stuff. So I carry a mild amount of guilt that I feel like I've missed out on a lot of people's openings. And I think often like those openings are when you're really having like the connectivity with people. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, like I have a yearning that things are way more kid and family friendly and have late hours so I can come after I put my kid to bed. But. Um, Ah, uh, what else? Mm. I, I, I mean, I don't think I would be sitting here if, without for the arts community. So like, I mean, like it was things like the community arts training that I got to do more grant writing. I got to make a lot of like connections with um, Erica over there, Kranzberg Foundation. They've been like really lifting me up right now as I've been trying to make a book as a new mom. So I mean, it's just like, I, I think for me sitting here, like the fact that I'm even here is probably because there's been like 50 other people in this room who have lifted me up in some way, you know? So like, ooh, I'm feeling a little bit teary about that. Um, 
it's a good reminder because I, I think sometimes I can be in my studio and think like, oh, I don't have anything else to say or nobody believes in me. But I think like that, 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 that kind of web like helps you like persist in making things. And, you know, just even somebody like coming to your show or asking you what you're doing right now um, is, is really like valuable and meaningful to me and I think maybe maybe what I'm connecting with in this moment is just that there's like an intimacy here that is possible with other artists if you stick around and you're like showing up for stuff and that that has probably kept me going in a way that if I moved to a big city and I was an isolated person I don't think I would have the same kind of like quality of experience that I've had so So we're going to open it up for questions, but I have one last question for our three panelists. And it's sort of the reason that we're here and that we have all of these wonderful organizations here, which is to kind of show the different ways in which organizations are kind of, um, their, their mission is to support artists, to help artists find uh, opportunity to help them navigate the really practical things um, to help with money and grants I mean it's the whole right it's the entirety of that it's the whole gamut but the question for the three of you is what what more what more do we need what more do you need how could we serve our artist community better um, all different kinds of institutions, all different kinds of people. What, what there's wonderful things that we've discussed. There are wonderful organizations, but what, what more? What would be even better? Hmm. Uh, I don't know. I think that's a, a kind of. Uh, I don't know if I have the answer for, uh, for that, but I, 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 I have been thinking about this because. The, the arts have changed uh, a lot over the the past four or five five years. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot more exposure artists have access to. They have their own platforms. Um, um, so, kind of thinking about what what does brick and mortar? What are those spaces? How do, how can they facilitate uh, community building? Um, you know, I think everyone's kind of like figure, figuring that out, but um, I mean, obviously, besides more opportunity, more money, because <laughs> that's that's really uh, what what it, what it comes down to. And artists have have proven, you know, when they, when they do get a chunk of money, it 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 goes far, and it, you know, they hire their friends, and you know, they you know they they do a lot of good in terms of like stimulating. Uh, Kind of putting money back into the community, but um, you know, just trying to find more ways of getting together, networking, um, connecting. You know, so I'll just leave it at that. Just more ways of connecting uh, is probably good because uh, you know, just kind of thinking about what we all kind of said. We've talked about the intimacy, the connecting, the supporting. I mean, we're we're all artists. We all know what we're going through. We're all like rooting for e each other. Uh, so finding, you know, low stake situations where we can be together and heal and talk and and kind of relax a little bit. But then also kind of warm up that engine again and you know talk about the work. You know, see if there's some collaborations involved. See, you know, get the juices kind of going because I think that's where the uh, you know, a lot of potential is is, is there. Uh, you know, so just kind of you know coming out of the pandemic, you know, first realizing that we all got to like heal and kind of get reconnected to each other, and then it's game on. Yeah, I mean, there there are a couple of things that you can actively do is to collect local art, um, collect you know, build your own collections. I have my own local art collection um, because I, I, I truly believe that, I mean, we've ruled out the point that St. Louis has talent. So just go out and, you know, support by collecting local artists. Also mentioning artists' names in rooms of opportunity. Um, a lot of the 
um, opportunities that I've had, majority of them come from artist friends. So say, hey, you should check Yvonne's work out, or you should check, you know, this project, you know, out. And there's a lot of power in word of mouth, really, in making sure that um, you're not pulling up an artist from another region, that you're supporting St. Louis artists, uh, and that we're put at the forefront of things. Um, also, encourage local um, institutions and museums to collect local artists. There are some impeccable works that should belong in permanent collections here. So rallying for that, encouraging our institutions to support um, the collection of local artists as well um, is a huge endorsement and that would put us on that uh, national and global stage. I guess I'll just use the infographics I made here. Let's see. Let's go back to these. Okay, here's my, my first one. This is about, um, well, our basic needs, health care. Like, I hear in Minneapolis, artists get really good health care, including mental health resources. Um, food, housing, which to me looks like affordable rent, cooperative living, living, living home purchasing support, work, meaningful and well-paid work particularly because I don't really want to have to work full time so that I can still have my studio practice. Um, and then I have kind of some more tangential needs, which to me are like having a collaborative spirit, connectivity, spaces, like so alternative spaces, places to share work here and beyond, exposure, exposure to artist talks, skill building, studio visits, financial boosts. Um, you want to go to the next one? Okay. This one is my obstacles. I was just thinking about my obstacles for being an artist. Um, energy, because when you're working a lot of jobs, then you don't always get to get to your studio. Spaces, trying to figure out where to show. Um, time, I am splitting my time with caregiving and working and teaching and, that, and, and art practice, so that's an obstacle. Well-being. Um, work, either needing it or having too much. Um, lacking networks sometimes and debt. Uh, I think education can be an obstacle. For instance, like I have, I got my MFA and I have been exposed to different grant writers, so I think that definitely like helps me when I'm doing these written things. So I think like MAPS, thank you for what you're doing to break through that. Um, and then I kind of like threw the social identity wheel on here, which I'll like speak to in both. But like, I think I would like to see that we're like making it more visible when we talk about artists, like the kind of roles of oppression and privilege in like their own careers too. Like, so I am a white woman, I am cisgender, I got my MFA, I grew up upper middle class. I had exposure to a lot of things. I got really well educated. I'm now pretty much middle class working, you know. Like, I struggle with certain, you know, mental health issues that mean that I have to like tend to myself in a certain way. But to me, like this, this kind of transparency starts to help me see through the system a little bit more. So like, I'm up here, but also I, I got super educated that helped me get up here. So. Um, and I think that's helpful for like if this feels if if the, if the art world starts to feel inaccessible to people like I want to start to be able to see where are those gaps that that's intriguing to me, um, and so like if I start to dream, you know, it's like we're removing some of the obstacles for artists where a form of oppression might be preventing them from being in this room or from accessing things like the Great Rivers or other opportunities where we are having access to free education, where we have increased time to make work, whether that's residencies, residencies with caregiving, uh, for anybody, other mothers in here or caregivers, uh, paying teaching artists really well. I know that RAC is really about that. More artist grants, helping us build more networks like studio visits, open studios. I would love to have more chances where artists that are in town would there would be a way that artists could connect with them through studio visits i don't know how that happens but like that would be something um 
debt. I would love if there was like emergency funding grants for artists. Um, I have friends who are like, I had to get a tooth pulled and now I'm in massive credit debt. <laughs> Seriously, like for artist friends, like, like I just, I think that people don't always realize that like if you're a working artist, you might not be having like a big savings that you set aside for yourself unless your partner is like working all of the time and able to do that for you. So sometimes those little things become big hits for an artist's ability to keep going. And then you kind of like live with a little bit of shame if you've got like a lot of debt you're walking around because of your tooth, you know? Uh, <laughs> so like I would love, um, and I love artist grants for personal expenses, not just like supply or project. Like I wanna be able to pay for a babysitter so I can be at my studio. Or I wanna be able to pay for preschool so I can be at my studio. Um, all the affordable healthcare, mental health resources are a dream for me. And I, yeah, I guess I hope any of these will help our collective energy here. So, I mean, that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we're gonna open up for a couple of questions um, for our three panelists. If anybody has a question, just raise your hand and Michelle will bring you a mic. Gina Graffos. Thank you all for being here. I'm just curious, um, I have two questions. One is about the jury process and how Cam leans into that big orbit of the who gets to decide. And then I'd like to ask the panel about the wash you elephant in the room. So the jury selection is very much um, that we internally staff try to come up with a list of people and it isn't always that the people that you ask can do it or say yes so it has to be a fairly robust list and over the last several years we've decided that it was really important for us to it used to be almost all curatorial and one of the things that um, we talked about was how important it would be to have an artist in the mix amongst the jurors. And so that's something that you see, I can't remember which one was the first one we sort of decided that that would be the model. And we've really sort of, it's a little intuitive, it's a little like who were the last jurors and what might be a different profile, um, who, what might they be interested in something that the last set were not. And that doesn't always work out either, but I think that that's how we kind of think of it. And we're also really interested in trying to get pretty good geographic distribution because the hope is not only will the jurors come in and do this and have a relationship with the 10 artists and then the three that are selected, but you kind of hope that there will be some relationships that last beyond the Great Rivers, right? That somewhere down the line, one of those curators or the artist or somebody in that jury pool says, oh, hey, you know, remember Yvonne? I want to do an exhibition with Yvonne. So, so it's also a little bit about trying to find also curatorial um, people who are at a certain level in their museological practice so that they might be able to take what they learn from St. Louis and really use it. But you know, all the planning, all the kind of moving around to the parts of the mosaic, and then you know, we've had years where we invited three people and they all said yes, and we've had years where, I gotta tell you, it was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, we keep getting no and time is getting shorter. So it really has depended. But I will say, in the five that I have seen, the five shows that I've seen, I've seen four of those juries. It's been really fun because they have been really different people and they've been interested in really different things. They also have really different styles in the um, studio visits and that I think has been really wonderful. Okay, the wash I can speak to the wash you elephant. <laughs> Oh yes, Gina, that is what I'm talking about with that 
social identity wheel. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the tension is right that you go to WashU or you go to grad school and you are like wanting to have this serious focus on your work. So you have all these people looking at you and kind of guiding you and giving you verbiage for it, helping you write these statements. So then we come down to something like the GRB and you've been so well prepared, like, I mean, but I, like WashU is not preparing you for the GRB. It's like preparing you for to be able to do that out in the in the in the art world. Certainly, um, I mean, I will say from my experience, I definitely I graduated in 2007 and I applied every year for the Great Rivers. Didn't get it till 2018. So my like it took me a long time to get there with what I had made from grad school, which actually totally shifted, primarily probably because of the St. Louis community. Um, so, you know, I think it, yeah, it is like, I think that's why like, I'm kind of interested in like things like maps are doing to help artists bring their proposals to help do writing. I mean, I think that would be great if we even had maybe something that talks about like, what does a studio visit look like, you know? I mean, um, who has a studio, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it does bring up those other kind of questions. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. Do you have other thoughts on it? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? Because you're watching Craig too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess even after school, it's almost like you, you kind of have to find alternative spaces to create. Uh, I think for the longest time, I was making work outside of a studio because I couldn't, um, I didn't have a studio, basically. So you become this sort of um, um, almost like public artist, if you may, out of necessity, and then you kind of make it a part of your practice because that's reality. But I mean, you're spot on with you know wash you equipping you with the vocabulary and uh, with the way to present work um, and uh, defend you know your ideas and whatnot. Um, and I, I think that it's important for other artists um, that don't have that kind of privilege to be access, have this accessibility to the Great Rivers Biennial. It's spot on. Yeah. Uh, I did not go to Wash U, uh, but uh, I did go to grad school. Um, but I'm also like wildly like learning disabled too. So like writing's not. Uh, my best friend. Um, so even though like I did get trained to write the the art talk, I guess is that what we call it these days. Uh, uh, I actually find it not really helpful uh, when writing grants. Mm -hmm. So um, so one thing that I that what I had to do is that while I was in grad school, I signed up for every grant. Uh, like seminar, I probably have taken over like 15. Uh, my first grant writer, Bridget Flynn, right there, uh, who I met in, in the Bronx on a panel. She was still working there uh, in New York, uh, but she kind of, you know, good good St. Louis connection. Kind of went through the ABCs of grant writing. Uh, I've definitely found my way at the St. Louis Library a handful of times, uh, you know, sitting there with my pencil and notebook writing on, on like how to write grants. So there are like, you know, if it doesn't come easy to you, uh, you know, th there are, there, I, there were opportunities uh, outside of school that I definitely took advantage of just meeting somebody for coffee to have them spell it out for me, going to the public library, going to RAC, uh, going to any type of resource where there's tons here uh, in St. Louis, um, and just sit in those seminars and kind of just do the work. Um, now seminars are like practices, writing game, or writing grants are like playing an actual game uh, and with each grant you write, you learn something, and you slowly s like sculpt them. Uh, I I feel like it's in, in my in my case. I never say like 
you stick the landing in one draft, like over time you constantly are sculpting and, and shaping your, your grant language. And the only way to do that is to apply to stuff and, and go to all these like seminars. So it's really kind of not the glamorous thing of when you think of an, of an artist uh, uh, in their studio, uh, majority of that art is the administration of the studio. Uh, and that takes, uh, you gotta find, you, you, gotta, you gotta fine tune your craft uh, in, in those skills. So, but there are, there are opportunities to, to do that. Anything else? Casey, it's nice, I know all the people asking questions. This isn't really a question, but I just kind of wanted to throw it in. Um, one thing that I love, and I've told Lisa before that I love about the contemporary is they're bringing people to St. Louis that are right on the cusp, or, you know, like I've never heard of them, and then they'll have a show here, and then they're, you know, huge in the art world. Like I remember Toyin Ojiojutola had her first museum solo here, and now, yeah, she's everywhere. Um, and so one thing that I think about, sorry, I always sound like I'm crying, like when I talk in front of people. I'm not emotional, but um, <laughs> when you said, like, what do we need? I think about that a lot. You know, I work on the third floor of my house, and in some ways, like as a mom, and I feel isolated, even though I've had this opportunity before, I do feel isolated. So what I would love to see in St. Louis is a residency program that you could apply for, even if you have a space or you don't have a space, but you're an artist in St. Louis. And much like the GRB, like, you know, depending on how big the building is, you could apply for a one-year residency to get community and intimately get to know your neighbor who might be in the studio next door. Um, and then part of that program, the, you know, okay, I'll just say Lisa. Lisa could invite um, contemporary artists to come and invite them to come to the same building and have a one-year residency. Um, because I feel like you guys have a pulse on that. Inviting them to our city allows the local artists to then have dialogue and have coffee and you know, you're in the hall, you're, you're passing each other and you're really forming community with not only who's here, but um, the greater art world and the amazing artists that you, you guys are bringing to St. Louis. So, no pressure, Lisa. But there might be someone oh, wait, here. Am I, am I doing this <laughs> residency? <laughs> you're gonna spread the word. This just brought a flashback. Back in uh, 2018, when I was told that I was a finalist, I didn't have a studio. Like I said, a lot of my work is outdoors. Um, I, I love interacting with public spaces. Um, and so I had to, um, I'm from Ghana, so I contacted the Guinean community here. And there was uh, this couple that allowed me to use their restaurant um, for my Great Rivers Biennial. So my first ever um, meeting with the panelists was this makeshift space um, that was actually a, a restaurant. So, I mean, you, you wanna find creative ways of making it happen. And, and don't be afraid to also reach out to people. I, I really find that St. Louis has a really generous community. People are willing to meet with you, have coffee with you, um, and to really look at the work that you're doing or offer any assistance that they may, um, you know, be able to offer you. So feel free to really reach out to, to folks. I've gotten a lot of luck that way, I guess. This one, okay. Is it possible to uh, include a stipend in the award so that you could make the work and be paid as opposed to getting, winning the competition and paying yourself out of the money you'd be spending to make the work? Is that a fair question? Sure. Um, it is, the, the way that it is given is it is a $20,000 award that is to be used by the artist however 
they like. And we have, you know, there are some famous stories of some past GRB winners saying like, I can't remember, either I, I get rent or, oh, it was how I opened my own space or something, right? Isn't that right? Or, you know, so people have used it in very different ways and depending on the kind of work that they are making, sometimes there isn't necessarily fabrication cost, et cetera. And so the entirety of that award goes to you as the artist and you can use it however you see fit. Um, you know, I can always bring it up with our wonderful partners, the Gateway <laughs> Foundation. Um, but it, it isn't that you are necessarily expected to use that award in any one particular way. Uh, as an artist, I often have more ideas than I have the time or resources to pursue. And I was curious, as artists, how do you prioritize what projects you want to pursue, what works you decide to create in your own life? Yeah, I always say that don't, don't wait for the opportunity. The opportunity will find you. Um, so as, as an artist, you're always filled with, you know, ideas and it would be really stifling to like say, well, this idea is great rivers biennial worthy. Allow your ideas and yourself to grow. Um, I, I would say that for all three times that I applied, they were totally different works, totally different spaces, totally different media. Um, and so there's, there's really, I don't think there's a math to it. I think the only thing that I did that was different was making sure that my idea was clear enough for three people that have never seen my work to have a full grasp of how it will actualize in the spaces that um, CAM has. So even if it means taking photographs uh, of CAM space, if you reach out to um, CAM, they will provide you with a plan. I believe a plan is online as well that you can download and start to mock up your ideas in space in connection with scale of the visitors and see how that would be. But yeah, you're, you're always filled with ideas. Um, and you, I guess you, I, I, I guess how I approach it is what is interesting to me in that moment that I'm applying. What am I curious about? How would uh, 20K bring the work to its fullest potential and then I go with that and of course you have to be passionate about whatever you're doing because it's a one-year commitment. Um, was this question just for the GRB or just in general? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, do you know David Lynch? So he's like an avid meditator. I like to meditate as well and um, I think he has a really beautiful idea which he waits for like the big fish and the big fish is the idea that like keeps coming back to him again and again and he'll say that he'll be like meditating and there'll be all these like tiny fish but the big fish just like keeps returning and so i um notice my big fish um because i'm i have this four-year-old i don't get to get to all my big ideas right now so i also just like keep a running notebook of the things i might want to make and i make sure that i have um different strategies of like entering projects. So like right now I have like really short windows. And so I'm like work, working more in like a book format of illustration because I just, I can't get into an animated story that has like hours and hours of research in the same way that I can get to like these short pictures that are coming to me. But like in my day to day, like a story or an image will resonate with me and as a big fish, it'll keep coming back. And then I know that's something that I, I need to follow through. So for me, when I get to something like the Great Rivers, like it's a big idea that's been sitting with me for a long time and like I'm ready to really sit with it. And maybe I've already been sitting with it before. Is that helpful? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I kind of had a couple thoughts uh, as I was kind of just listening here. Um, 
Yeah, I very much agree with you. It's, it's not really about what idea you have. It's really about how you're presenting it in the, in my opinion, the most direct, clear way. Uh, straight out of the gate, the first sentence, this is what I'm going to be doing. Uh, um, I always kind of think, picture of three drawers, got on a plane, got here, hotel, talk, lunch, they get a stack of applications that they kind of have to go through. They're spending 10 minutes on each, you know, if that maybe, I don't know. If you have a, if you have to go through a hundred applications, you know, you know, if you spend five minutes on each, that adds up pretty. So my point is that they're looking at them and reviewing them in a certain way where they, you don't have time to, to flirt. <laughs> you have to just be direct in what you're, what you're talking about. Um, and that's kind of hard. That's kind of hard to do sometimes because as artists, everything we do is precious, you know, and everything kind of builds and methodical. And this point really emphasizes that point, which kind of means you're going to have to leave some stuff out. So like, so you really have to like look at your idea and just pick three of the top things that you want to share and then put that in your application. Uh, beyond that, everything will start cannibalizing itself because, you know, if you have 10 things, you know, you, you don't want the juror to think about 10 things. You want the juror to think about one thing uh, or, and then supportive images after that. So it's really, for me, it's really being direct. Um, and the, uh, a, a really helpful tool is if you have an opportunity to judge or review applications, do that. Uh, I've, uh, for a time in my life, that was something that I did. Uh, like I did it for a couple of years, just reviewing applications. I reviewed for the NEA and all sorts of other types of stuff. You definitely realize just because if you're looking at 50, you know what is a good application and what is a stinker. Like, and you're, you're, it's such a learning tool. You're just like, man, page or paragraph three, and now they tell me the idea? Like, I wish they would have said that, you know, because time's a tick. So, like, I feel like <laughs> reviewing, reviewing, I mean, if someone has a nice, concise budget and is direct, I'm just like, ah, oh, yes, thank you. You're in that pile. Like, <laughs> for real. Like, so I, I really encourage, if you have opportunities to review grants, that is probably a really good, uh, tool for learning how to write them. Well, I want to thank you three very, very much, not only for participating tonight, but for the incredible work that you brought into this institution. We are so grateful for that. And I thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to thank everyone who is here. I really want to thank all the organizations who came to spend their evening here and to share um, the opportunities and the possibilities that they do have, that we do have here um, in St. Louis for Artists. Thank you so much for being here. And it's, it's, it really is a nice moment to kind of think about how lucky we are indeed, if you think about the number of art, art that we are choked with talent here in St. Louis. I'm going to be using that quote for a long time. But thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you.